All right. Hello and welcome to the second installment of this semester's Gender Talk series. My name is Dr. M. Shadi Malaklu, and I am the Chair of Women's and Gender Studies at Berea College and the Founding Director of its Women's and Gender Nonconforming Center. Thank you for joining us today for a virtual conversation with famed filmmaker and scholar activist Dr. Susan Stryker. We are so very excited to host her and you for this conversation about trans history in the present. We regret that we cannot host Dr. Stryker and all of you in person on Berea's beautiful campus over a hearty lunch, as we usually do. We hope to resume on-campus programming as soon as it is safe to do so. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram for details about the rest of this semester's virtual programming, which is all open to the public. I'd like to start today's event by acknowledging the hard work of my colleagues, Dr. Meredith Lee, Kimberly Saderholm, Mandy Snowden, Sabina Sabal, and Destiny Easley. Without their tireless efforts, this, this series and none of our programming would be possible. With no further delay, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Susan Stryker is popularly known as the founder of what we now call Trans Studies. She is a former professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Arizona, uh, director of its Institute for LGBT Studies and founder of its Transgender Studies Initiative. Currently, she holds an appointment as the Barbara Lee Distinguished Chair in Women's Leadership at Mills College in Oakland. She joins us from there today, sharing her time with us quite generously as she and other local residents are currently under siege of the wildfires. Dr. Stryker's many publications include Gay by the Bay, A History of Queer Culture in the San Francisco Bay Area, Queer Pulp, Perverted Passions from the Golden Age of the Paperback, The Transgender Studies Reader, and perhaps most famously, Transgender History. Dr. Stryker is also the founding co-editor of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. Founded in 2014, TSQ is the first non-medical academic journal committed to covering issues pertaining to the trans community. In addition to her important work as a scholar activist, Dr. Stryker um, is an Emmy-winning filmmaker. She won the Emmy for her 2005 documentary, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria, about the 1966 Jean Compton Cafeteria Riot that she will address in her remarks today. Responding to Dr. Stryker's remarks is Berea's own Assistant Professor of Women's and Gender Studies, Dr. Meredith Lee. Dr. Lee's research examines the construction of the wrong body narrative, the assumption that a trans man is trapped in a woman's body and vice versa within sexological and psychi psychiatric discourse. Drawing from sexological literature, anti-abolitionist texts, theology, transgender studies, and black studies, Dr. Lee's work attempts to address the role that anti-blackness has played in the creation of the wrong body narrative and thus in our contemporary understandings of transsexuality and transgender identity. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker and respondent, and please know that you are welcome and encouraged to submit questions to the Q&A forum throughout the talk. Thank you, and with no further delay, I will pass it off to Dr. Stryker. Hello. Um, thank you so much, Shadi, for that warm introduction uh, and for the invitation to come to campus. Um, I wish I could be there physically. Uh, happy to be here virtually. Um, if there's any problem with my audio, uh, you know, please put something in the chat so I know that that's that's the need to address it somehow. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for the comments that I know that you'll be making, and all of the other people who you know have already been thanked for um, for um, for the the work that's been involved in. Um, supporting my visit here today. And thank you all for coming. All right, well, with no further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and start a PowerPoint and uh, begin my remarks for today. Manifesting the realness of our identities is what we trans people do. 
and we bring worlds along with us. This is our superpower, our burden, our necessity, our gift. And this is what transpires now. New realities, emergent trans realities, flowing across the gap that separates actuality from desire, flowing from what is to what will be. Something has already shifted, something tectonic, climatic. We see the evidence all around us as surely as the continents grindingly adjust their placement, as surely as new patterns of earth, air, fire, and water arrange themselves across the planet's warming surface. Gender, a vast impersonal social apparatus that whispers the secret of our identities into our ears and places us with our kind. Gender itself has changed, is changing still, is changing us all of us. The novel configurations of personhood now bubbling to the top of the cultural stew, the new gender minorities now clamoring for social recognition, all are signs and symptoms of a deeper flux in the field of life. The story of that leviathan, gender, within and against whose shifting shape we all move in our own peculiar ways, is the story that now must be told anew. History is not the past. History is a story we tell in the present, one that reaches back to join what can be known of what has already taken place to our vision of whatever yet may come. History is not a fact, it is a promise. It is the assurance that the future will be as different from the current moment as the current moment has become from all that has come before. History is a witness. It bears testimony to the inescapability of difference and the inevitability of change. To write history can be more than piling one dead fact on top of another to fill up the empty void of time. It can be more in constructing a monument to the violence of the great and powerful, more than the satisfaction of a craving among the people for the sweet comfort of nostalgia at the end of a bitter day. To write history, for those of us who need another world, is to catch sight elsewhere of radical possibilities made visible by the light current calamity. History transpires in the here and now, it is a story that confers realness on pasts that are unremembered and actions now unimagined in anticipation of futures that must be summoned forth from a present moment that demands our daily effort to shatter and transform it. I want to share a few words now about a place I've spent a quarter century uh, researching the intersection of Turk and Taylor Streets in San Francisco's inner city Tenderloin neighborhood. Um, some of this, if you read the uh, recommended reading for today's talk, you'll re recognize some passages here. Um, Turk and Taylor Streets physically cross each other exactly once, um, but that single point in space is occupied by many different social realities where we can stand together at the crossroads of this historic moment in time, inside the nested crises of the COVID pandemic and our social, political, economic, and environmental circumstances. In August 1966, at the corner of Turk and Taylor, trans women, street queens, gay hustlers, queer kids abandoned by their families, and other marginalized people fought back against police oppression at an all-night restaurant once located there, Compton's Cafeteria. That night, when police came to raid the place in a routine act of harassment, one of the queens threw her coffee in cop's face. And with that, the patrons rose up and resisted, turning over tables, throwing sugar shakers through the windows, and driving the police back into the streets. You can learn more uh, about this historic act of defiance by watching the documentary my friend Victor Silverman and I made about it, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Conference Cafeteria, or by reading about it in my book, Transgender History, The Roots of Evolution. Some of the people who fought that night uh, lived in the Highland Hotel, 
which was once occupied, uh, or which once occupied the floors above Compton's, uh, or in many of the other cheap hotels like the El Rosa that lined Turk Street. These were some of the few places that visibly trans women were allowed to live back then, when working in the neighborhood sex industry was one of the few jobs available to them. The revolt at Compton's was a bold assertion of their fundamental right to exist in public space, one that contested the criminalization of their lives. Uh, San Francisco honored the legacy um, of that instance uh, in 2017 when it officially designated the neighborhood um, uh, when it designated the neighborhood around the old Compton's cafeteria as the transgender district, largely as a result of research that I had done into the neighborhood's remarkable trans history, which helped lay a foundation that then became a platform for empowering trans lives and the presence. Uh, I'd intended to show a brief uh, video featuring the district manager, Aria Saeed, um, one of the three black trans women, along with Honey Mahogany and Janetta Johnson, all three of whom are uh, pictured here, uh, who worked with the city of San Francisco to formally establish uh, the district. I'm unfortunately not going to show that video because we're having some technical difficulties with it, uh, but I encourage you to look up San Francisco Transgender District, uh, and uh, you can find the video on, on their YouTube channel um, and, and watch it there. Well, well, one of the things that, um, and, and all of the you know really amazing, powerful things Aria has to say, one of the things she doesn't mention uh, is that the historic site of resistance to the criminalization of trans lives at the intersection of Turk and Taylor in the heart of the world's first urban district established to empower trans lives is now occupied by a private incarceration facility. Uh, for nearly 30 years, uh, the former Highland Hotel uh, above the old Compton's cafeteria has been a glorified jail disguised as uh, an inner city apartment building mainly labeled the 111 Taylor Street Apartments uh, on the awning over the door. Uh, the facility is operated by, <coughs> excuse me, ah, there is that smoke that is still lingering in the air and my lungs. Uh, the facility uh, is operated by Geo Group, the world's largest private prison company. Although California recently passed Assembly Bill 32 to ban private uh, prisons, the law created a huge loophole for any facility, quote, providing educational, vocational, medical, or ancillary services to an inmate. Geo Group's Taylor Street facility is called a residential reentry program or halfway house that uh, provides exactly those services under contract for inmates uh, of both California state prisons and federal prisons in California. <clears throat> Don't be fooled. This is just a way to rebrand an incarceration facility as a social welfare agency. Geo Group prides itself on pioneering new forms of incarceration, including electronic monitoring as a prison without walls uh, and camouflaged carceral facilities like the one at Turk and Taylor. It runs immigration detention facilities for ICE. These are literally the same people who make money putting kids in cages in camps along the border with Mexico. All told, Geo Group manages 95,000 beds at 129 carceral facilities worldwide and provides what they euphemistically call community supervision services for more than 210,000 people. They made profits last year of $166 million on assets worth $4.3 billion. Geo Group's occupation of the building at the intersection of Turk and Taylor needs to be ended. Abolition now is not a utopian slogan. It is a current demand, realizable, if not in the present, then in the near term. The government, the US government's initial $2.2 trillion bailout um, back in <clears throat> March and April uh, in response to the COVID pandemic gave the lie to all those tired old stories about how some things are simply, simply too big or too expensive to change, even as it called our attention to the ongoing inadequacy of access to healthcare, employment, income, housing, and food for so many millions of people. 
the inspiring uprisings for racial justice that have swept the United States and around the world in the wake of the latest surge in an ongoing, in an uninterrupted wave of police killings have shown how little willingness remains for tolerating deep-rooted systemic racism. The massive Black Trans Lives Matters gathering in Brooklyn uh, on June 14th, 2020, and other similar events across the country to protest the ongoing targeting of Black trans women in particular, people like Raya Milton, Dominique Fells, Ellie Williams, and at least 25 others this year shows just how much popular support there is for challenging transphobia even amidst the worst surge in anti-trans violence since statistics have been kept. A whopping 79% of people in the United States supported the US Supreme Court decision on June 15th that trans people should be protected from employment discrimination. Led by the bold decision of the Minneapolis City Council to defund and abolish its police force, other cities from coast to coast have followed with similar initiatives of their own for dismantling an irredeemably broken system of pol policing and incarceration. All of these issues, honoring and uplifting trans lives while combating the forces that diminish and extinguish them, can be addressed simultaneously when, together, collectively, we inhabit the crossroads at the intersection of Turk and Taylor. Crossroads in many cultural traditions from around the world, but particularly in those of the African diaspora, are symbolically charged places where one realm of existence touches another and dangerous transformative encounters can take place across some significant, some significant difference between those who meet there. It's where Faust met Mephistopheles to wager his soul and Robert Johnson made a deal with the devil to learn how to play the blues. A crossroads is literally a place of crisis where in order to move forward, we must choose one or another. More than a mere intersection, the crossroads are a place to dream and to conjure new realities through the paths we choose. What crossroads might we discover at the intersection of Turk and Taylor? <clears throat> the social fabric of the historically left-leaning city of San Francisco has been tattered by tech-driven gentrification, uh, displacing longtime residents and creating one of the worst home affordability and houselessness crises in the country. There is a desperate need for affordable housing, particularly among communities of color, and even more pressingly, among Black and Indigenous people of color, people uh, uh, especially if they're also queer or trans or non-binary or feminine appearing or excluded from meaningful work or currently or formally incarcerated. Why not liberate the historic site of trans resistance from its occupation by a private for-profit prison and turn it into something that better serves these many unmet needs? What would it be like for our actions in the streets to make the operation of Geo Group's Taylor Street facility impossible? to collectively insist that the needs of the incarcerated be met by other means that served them better and profited no one but themselves? Why not demand that the city of San Francisco divert money from police and jails that disproportionately criminalize and contain people of color and trans people to support a community-led effort that sustains Black trans lives and the lives of the formerly incarcerated by a private jail into low-income housing? Why not provide office space for government agencies and nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations that better serve our communities? Why not reopen a cafeteria on the now vacant ground floor that Compton's once occupied to provide training and employment opportunities for people exiting incarceration and re-entering the workforce? Why not partner with the museum and organizations uh, that are in the neighborhood to create historical and cultural programs and exhibitions to showcase the neighborhood's inspiring history of resistance and resilience? All of this could be possible to the extent that we collectively assert our political will to make it a reality. I draw inspiration for the sort of work that I do from the words of 
Friedrich Nietzsche, some of whom I kind of paraphrased in the opening remarks in an essay fittingly entitled On the Uses and Abuses of History for the Living. Nietzsche begins that 1876 essay by quoting the great German romantic thinker and writer Johann von Goethe, um, who says that he despises everything which merely instructs me without increasing or immediately enlivening my activity. Nietzsche goes on to say that we must seriously despise instruction without vitality. We must despise knowledge which saps activity. We must despise history imagined only as an expensive surplus of knowledge and as a luxury. To be sure, Nietzsche says, we need history but we need it in a manner different from the way in which the spoilt idler in the garden of knowledge uses it. That is, we need it for life and for action, not a comfortable turning away from those things. We wish to use history only insofar as it serves the living. He winds up saying, only those who are oppressed by a present need and who want to cast off their burden at any price have need for a critical history. That is a history that sits in judgment. <clears throat> in the time that's left for me today, I wanna to highlight a few of my recent efforts as a storyteller and increasingly as a trans elder uh, to make transgender history useful uh, in today's tenderloin. Uh, and in the broader world by continuing to activate the legacy of the Compton's Cafeteria Riot that transpired 54 years ago month. Um, I share this information as an example of how it's possible uh, to foster that critical perspective on history in the present for the living that Nietzsche spoke of, a history that allows us to sit in judgment of the injustices oppressed communities have suffered. Um, on June 18th, uh, <clears throat> this past summer, uh, I helped organize a protest called Courthouse to Compton's. Uh, my friend Julian Carter and I uh, had uh, started planning it only about 10 days earlier. Uh, we're both white people uh, who try to do solidarity work on anti-Black racism to show up for racial justice. Uh, and uh, we had both kind of grown impatient uh, with the sort of checkbook activism or online activism that, you know, we had been doing during the, the pandemic lockdown while we were, you know, each sheltering in our homes. Uh, we were inspired by all of the youth-led marches and rallies that were taking place at that time, and we wanted to make our own contribution uh, at that moment of highly visible public protest. And our goal was to work closely with and follow the guidance and leadership of Black trans women, uh, but to take on the burden of coordinating and organizing, you know, the work ourselves <clears throat> with a team of collaborators drawn from our personal networks. We want to provide an outlet for the anger that we anticipated over what we were sure was going to be bad news from the Supreme Court on Monday, June 14th, when the decision was expected on whether or not Titles 7 and 9 of the Civil Rights Act um, protected uh, against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender expression. And we wanted to link that sense of anger that we were expecting to trans people's history of resistance. <clears throat> the plan was to um, assemble um, in front of the federal courthouse and, uh, and to a few short blocks from there to the side of the old Compton's cafeteria at Turk and Taylor to hold a, a rally. Now, as it turned out, the Supreme Court decision went in our favor, uh, and there was uh, a celebratory vibe uh, infusing the march as much as there was one of the uh, you know, re resistance and protest. It felt for a couple of hours like we had won and that we were taking the streets in victory. Uh, here's a brief video that I shot um, on top of the bus that we were using as our mobile uh, platform for the rally. Uh, it runs uh, about four minutes. I might cut it off a little sooner than that. Um, uh, but let me just give you a little context for what you will be seeing. Uh, one of the staff members at the Trans District, Janelle Luster, 
uh, was already on top of the bus when I climbed up there. It's about to leave uh, the plaza uh, in front of the courthouse and start marching. Uh, a row of police officers on motorcycles was watching us uh, as we got rolling. And Janelle turned to me and said, Susan, you were one of the organizers for this. Do you know if anybody invited a police presence here today? I said, you know, no, this is a, an unpermitted, you know, unpermitted best action and we are engaging in civil disobedience to take the streets and she said well all right then we're going to start chanting fuck the police you know and that's what she started shouting through the megaphone as we set out so as you watch the video pay attention not just to the slogans being shouted or the size of the crowds but also to the tent encampments along the sidewalks and the vacant lots um, and to the fact that the vast majority of the people at the protest were wearing masks, you know, that, that everybody there recognized that gathering in a large group presented a risk of, of COVID infection, but they, uh, they felt that the issues being raised were important enough to take that risk while at the same time taking every possible precaution while protesting. All right, now. All right. Well, I'm going to stop there. I um, uh, apologize if there wasn't sound. I'm not sure that there was. That was the technical difficulty we were having with the other slide. Um, but um, anyway, I hope you at least in, um, appreciated the visuals. So at the end of the day, uh, we assembled a coalition of 25 co-sponsoring organizations, included the No New uh, SF Jails Coalition, San Francisco Chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, the Sunrise Movement, uh, uh, API Equality of Northern California, um, you know, there's a, a, a number of others that I, I've listed here. I'm going to move through this part of the um, uh, presentation a little more quickly than I had anticipated. It's taking a little longer than I had timed this, and I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Um, but uh, here you can see some of the coalition of um, supporting organizations that we put together. Uh, a few weeks after the Courthouse to Compton's March, um, I was able to help weave the legacy of trans resistance 
violence at Turk and Taylor, uh, along with our efforts to oust Geo Group from the Tenderloin into a larger national tapestry. Uh, I did so through my participation as one of 80 artists, writers, and activists who came together over the 4th of July weekend to co-create what lead organizers uh, Castles, who's a white transmasculine artist, and Rafa Esparza, a Latinx cis man who's an artist and activist, um, to put together what they called a highly orchestrated mediagenic spectacle called In Plain Sight. So that what we did, uh, each of us came up with um, a slogan that we wanted to be spelled out uh, by skywriting airplanes flying over detention facilities, immigration courts, borders, and other similar um, sites of vulnerability for migrants uh, to make visible in the air above us something that too often remains seen and unspoken on the ground. Uh, in Plain Sight was um, designed to sort of break through the walls of secrecy and expose sites of detention and incarceration to public scrutiny. Um, my own contribution to the project involved uh, linking the history at Turk and Taylor to the ICE detention facility in Eloy, Arizona, uh, not only through a critique of private for-profit incarceration, uh, but also sort of by means of the increasingly familiar uh, those still somewhat surreal uh, virtual connections of the Zoom interface. So we brought together people on the ground at Eloy uh, in Southern Arizona uh, with people in San Francisco, um, some of it, and we wo wove in um, uh, some of the footage that I just showed you from, from the protest. And we wrote over, or had, you know, had the Skywriters date over the, um, uh, the detention facility at Eloy, the word release, um, you know, as a, both an imperative command to free the prisoners, but also as an invitation to all of us on the outside to release ourselves from whatever fear we harbored about those who had been detained um, that contributed to their captivity. Uh, the local artists we worked with in Tucson, Kristen Nelson, Cornide, Julia Slosberg, Adam Cooper Terran, and uh, Carolina Lopez Barrera, um, who uh, is pictured here. Uh, who was a former uh, detainee at Eloy, who now uh, runs a, a safe house for uh, trans women, migrants, and refugees called Casa Mariposa. Um, I had hoped to show you um, another video here, but again, more te technical difficulties. Um, and so I just, quote of Carolina speaking in the video uh, 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 with this, you know, to my mind, really inspiring, um, inspiring words. You can maybe read those for yourself. Um, you know, but basically, she, you know, she says, for me, prisons should not exist. I uh, love it that she says, you looking at me from wherever you are, are now makes me stronger. This is my weapon. It helps me grow as a person. Uh, and she ends with a call for solidarity, you know, uh, fighting for what's just, you know, for what should be, but what is not, at least not yet. And that solidarity is what will change everyone's heart. Um, she says, I imagine the world is one without borders or walls, the walls will fall or be turned into bridges. And we're gonna end here with the last um, of activism that I have done in the past few months about mobilizing the legacy of Turk and Taylor um, that um, a bunch of us got together and painted a street mural and it says Black Trans Lives Matters at the intersection of Taylor. And this was actually something that was supported by the city of San Francisco. Um, all right, I'm just gonna end there. Thank you all for joining me today at the intersections of Turk and Taylor in virtual space across time zones and locations that converge in the crossroads of our shared historical moments. 
uh, when this world that we have inherited is in such profound crisis and we are struggling to give birth to a better one. May our coming together here nurture and inspire our visions for how we might survive to address the pressing needs we see around us and that we feel in our own bodies. Let us join our energies in an effort to center the lives of the most vulnerable among us, learn from the histories of resistance that it matters to resist and that they leave their traces and that a different world is indeed possible. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Stryker, for that really generative conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Meredith Lee, who's going to give us a response. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. And um, thank you, Dr. Stryker, that was so amazing. Such an insightful talk. Um, I'm so grateful that you came and spoke with us today. First, for pretty much selfish reasons, because you're one of my mentors, but also because we get to experience the kind of revolutionary work that you do in the midst of so much disillusion and pain. So it's very uplifting to see how much you've been doing. This is very important for us, especially here at Berea, because the rural South and Appalachia don't always have access to such brilliant trans feminists or Susan Stryker, right? Um, I'm going to dive right into the questions so we have some time for Q&A. I really like this idea of the crossroads. And I would love to hear about how these crossroads connect to what Sadia Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery, uh, which we've talked about in my classes, um, which includes skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. Racialized gender is no doubt, um, racialized gender no doubt underpins the crossroads of Turk and Taylor. I'm interested in the ways in which these crossroads exist within the afterlife of slavery and would love to hear any comments you have on that. Would you like to answer that now and then I'll pile on more later? Or do you want me to just pile on questions? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll just say briefly that it's like, yes, I think you're right. And yes, everybody should read Sadia Hartman and think about what I just said in the light of what, you know, she, she writes about. And I just want to reflect back that, you know, I think part of the afterlife of slavery is what, um, you know, what, what the Afro-Caribbean novelist and critical theorist um, um, Sylvia Winter, you know, calls, you know, what she called biocentrism, you know, that the idea that our identities are rooted in a biological substance. I mean, of course, we all have, you know, we're biological creatures. We live through this organic materiality, but the idea that that there is some kind of like reality that grounds our identity and our flesh, that the categories that we live through are sort of biologically given and kind of inescapable. Uh, that's a biocentric view of how identity works that is rooted in the transatlantic slave history. It's like it's rooted in that legacy of saying, if your body looks like this, it is in fact a form of bondage that puts you inexorably into this social economic hierarchy that is supposed to be inescapable because of its very givenness and materiality. And if we think about our gender identities that way, it's kind of like that is in a sense of, you know, I see it as a way of perpetuating an ideology that is a legacy of slavery. Uh, and that transness is a different kind of fugitivity from that that's that biocentric view of what our body means and it is a really imaginative reworking of what it means to like live our particular flesh outside this apparatus you know uh, this apparatus of social control and hierarchization in a way that to me aligns a trans politics with histories and legacies and movements for racial liberation. Thank you. Um, as you say, San Francisco is experiencing gentrification, which in turn pushes out many people of color and poor people. In fact, 111 Taylor Street <clears throat> is another form of gentrification through privatization. Can you expand upon the afterlife of San Francisco in relation to what it was before in the 1980s and 1990s when it was so very queer and so very multiracial 
and also um, sort of separately but together, what surrounds 111 Taylor Street Apartments now? Who resides there? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I could teach a course on that question. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, ba ba basically, um, I mean, like everywhere else, it's like the city of San Francisco, everywhere else in North America, it's like the city of San Francisco is to some degree, it's like it's a settler colonial formation, you know, that it was colonized by the Spanish starting in the 18th century, you know, then it was Mexican California. Um, then, you know, there was the Mexican American War where the US, you know, took over California. So there's many layers of colonization mm -hmm. there. But the San Francisco that most people think of really took shape in the, you know, after 1849, 1850 in the context of the gold rush that brought this very um, uh, diverse, you know, bunch of people to San Francisco through all around the Pacific Rim. Uh, from, you know, from China, from Latin America, from Australia, uh, all across North, North America. And that San Francisco for a century and a half, I would say, was both, um, you know, there, it had a reputation for being a really diverse and cosmopolitan city, uh, for being uh, kind of a wide open town that, you know, it's kind of like loose and bohemian and creative. Um, you know, it's always been a city, partly because of its, you know, legacy like with the maritime trades, you know, so many sailors and working class people from all over, you know, like living outside bourgeois norms. Uh, it's been a pretty, pretty queer place. Um, you know, it's been a magnet for uh, sort of self-selected um, uh, LGBTQ people who want to go live in a, a progressive place. I mean, it's been really cool that way. And, you know, I think particularly since the 1960s with the rise of, um, you know, my minority social movements, uh, that San Francisco, you know, like six, 60s through the 90s was, um, you know, it was, that was kind of like its high watermark as um, a place where like, you know, what we would call like progressive queer people uh, increasingly were, you know, like visible, vibrant, you know, uh, woven into the fabric of the community, had positions of leadership in the community. You know, I don't want to paint it in too rosy of pictures, but it's like there was something really special, you know, going on in San Francisco in those decades. And increasingly, as San Francisco has become the global center of you know, the high tech industry, I mean, Silicon Valley, you know, Silicon Valley has taken over the world. And, you know, San Francisco is ground zero of Silicon Valley, you know, and so the kind of the world that Silicon Valley is forging, you know, like this is the 21st century global economy. You know, you just see what it is producing, these incredible disparities of wealth. I mean, there are like more billionaires per capita in the San Francisco Bay Area than anywhere else in the world. You've got this like, you know, housing and high rise office building construction that's going on. Um, people, you know, ordinary people can't afford to live here anymore. It's like if, you know, my, my partner had not, you know, been kind of foresighted and bought a house back in the 1980s it's like i wouldn't be able to live in san francisco you know um you know it's just too expensive that you know you're seeing these vast income disparities you're seeing minorities leave i think san francisco has one of the lowest concentrations or lowest percentages of um uh, black people of any major city in the United States. I think it's somewhere around like six or seven percent right now. Um, I mean, it's it's you know every, every everybody who suffers any kind of economic injustice because of how their bodies position them in the world. It's like they can't afford San Francisco anymore, you know. And um, you know, and so what surrounds Turk and Taylor now? It is like the poorest city. I mean, the, the poorest neighborhood in the city, you know, it's like, it's people who live in SRO hotels. There's a lot of people on the streets, as you saw, there's a lot of people, I mean, they're tent encampments, you know, uh, you know, in, in San Francisco, in the Tenderloin. It's really, um, it's a really shocking 
level of disparity that that we're seeing. Um, I mean, I I could go on and on, but anyway, it's like so. But I just sort of feel like I have been, for whatever reason, historically positioned as like the storyteller of the intersection of Turk and Taylor. You know, like that's what the cosmos you know gave me to do, among other things. And uh, I feel like by you know by like really attending to what happens there. You know, all of the multiple intersections of things that are happening it becomes a very very local place to address these like planetary scale changes that we are experiencing right now um so anyway i can say more but i probably shouldn't because i'm looking at the clock yeah i think i have like a ton more to say to you but i'm gonna let um shadi dr malakwe take over and have the audience ask you some questions but thank you again you're welcome. Thank you. And we'll be in touch because we've got things to talk about. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Stryker. We are so thrilled um, to be in conversation with you about this. So we have some questions from the audience. Uh, one question is, what are your thoughts on abolition and how transformative justice or restorative justice fit into that concept? Um, I'll just say I support the concept, you know, it's like, I don't know what more to, to say, you know, that, um, you know, there will be pragmatists who say, hey, you know, you can't turn the battleship overnight, you know, you can only make these sort of like incremental changes. And, you know, there's also some truth in that, but, you know, I think abolition is, it's, um, it's as much a vision as anything else. It's like, it's about holding the vision in the present moment that uh, there are systems, structures, institutions that we live inside that are just unjust, you know, from the word go, and that they are violent and oppressive and death dealing. And that, you know, the goal is not to make them less death dealing. It is just to say like, no, it's like we, this, this, is, this needs to be, abolished and that abolition is i mean besides um you know an insistence on justice you know here and now and what your ultimate values are you know besides putting forth the vision that something fundamentally different is possible that you know i think it's also a practice of you know the soul if you want to look at it that way it is like in some ways it's about acting in the knowledge that we are already free at some level and just demanding that we take up as much space with our freedom as as possible that we you you, you live free you know that is the abolitionist perspective to me mm -hmm. refusing to concede to the power that this structure has over you somehow staying free in yourself thank you dr striker our next question is, how can we push back against the efforts of actors like GEO Group to make carceral facilities invisible and raise awareness about facilities like 111 Taylor Street? Yeah, well, you know, that's the, um, that's the trick right there. I mean, it's just like, because we are all, as individuals, only capable of so much, you know, that our you know, we, we can only reach so far in our actions as individuals. And it really is a kind of a collective process. It's like, I can do, you know, what I can do, you know, being the storyteller and telling stories that raise awareness and perhaps change consciousness. I can plant seeds that can perhaps become parts of broader movements. But, you know, it's like, it just, it takes the people, you know, it takes, you know, I, I, I kind of like using the word the multitude, you know, like the, it takes, it takes lots of individual bodies coming together in new forms of sociality, enacting new relations with each other according to different values to transform the world, you know, and that it's not, um, there's no silver bullet, there's no magic pill, there's no one action that we can take. It's all of us collectively refusing to live one way while demanding that it be possible to live another and to just simply begin living differently 
among ourselves with each other to the you know to the best of our abilities and to you know to be uncompromising in the the sense of like re resistance and the demand for transformation of something that is simply unjust so you know my immediate goal would be to say can we it's like the lease on that building uh, at 111 Taylor Street is going to come up at some point and can there be local action to like get the city to buy the property you know like to work with the you know I mean we're probably not going to overthrow private property anytime in the next you know 12 to 24 months it's like can we get the city to work with the building owners to like not renew the lease to GeoCorp and can you know, the geo group and, and can the city take the building and turn it over to the trans district so that it would be something that would, its uses would be determined by, um, you know, a, a more community rooted process, you know. So that's what I can try to do, you know, in the time ahead, you know, it's like, but, you know, GeoCorp is, um, you know, it's a, it's a transnational organization. What are people doing locally, you know? Um, so, you know, we all just got to get busy. Yep. We have a, a, our next question is complicated, but in a way that I think is really necessary. So how do one, the carceral apparatus privatized or not, and two, the process of gentrification and implicit privatization of public space create situations of higher policing of black and brown trans life? What is it about trans life that is seen as problematically or pathologically public? How do trans folks insist on interiority, on autonomy, on privacy, while also fighting for the right to be and move in public without punishment and control? You're right, that is a very complicated question. And I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but it's just like, I think that it's like a, this is more of a comment than a question kind of, kind of statement you know it's just like I don't I don't know that I can do anything more in the few minutes that we've got left than to just say like I think the way those questions are phrased uh, is um, it's not like they answer themselves but it's like it's like they raise all the right questions they connect all the right dots that that all of those things that are asked as a question could be rephrased as statements to say like this is what's happening this is what happens now th these interlocking things and you know and so like what do we do it's kind of like well it's back to the question of like how is it that you like try to like live in, from an abolitionist perspective you know like that 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 turf that ground was like laid out super well so like thank you for the the, the question um and maybe you know what i would say is you know my, my email is readily available if you know we want to have that conversation offline and i hope this doesn't you know that doesn't seem like a you know like i'm dodging a question it's just a yeah i i see we've got four minutes left and um, nice to actually to our next question and i'll leave the the room with this which is what are some ways that you find respite or rejuvenation or joy while also doing the work um, that is difficult, you know, to discuss violence and oppression? Uh, great, great question, because I do think self-care is important. Um, and, you know, I'll just say I, part of my privilege, you know, uh, is that I have a secure home. I have access to food you know i feel like i can like maintain some you know kind of uh, sense of shelter for myself you know just like physically you know it's like i've got a comfortable place to be i'm not going hungry i get good sleep at night i'm able to like you know exercise and stretch and you know do my yoga and stay hydrated and you know like all of that you know all that stuff um i feel like I have a good network of people around me. I take a lot of um, uh, comfort and pleasure uh, in my, you know, my, my crew, you know, just like I've got people around me where I think we can be mutually supportive of each other. I, you know, I have a partner, I have kids, um, you know, it's like family is actually important to me. Um, you know, it's like, it's, um, it's uplifting and sustaining. 
And, um, you know, there, there is that um, a activist sense. I heard, you know, I heard somebody say it's like you can't just, you know, like find your what, what sustains you in the, um, the vision that you're, you're working towards. You know, it's like you have to kind of like find joy in the struggle, you know. And so it's like, yeah, like I kind of feel like when I'm doing the more activist work, it's like, yeah, like I'm just it's like it might be hard. There might be talk toxicity that I encountered. Last week I was doing something that got Zoom bombed by right wing 4chan trolls who like hijacked the Zoom space and which is like it's like five minutes of like screaming, yelling, you know, electronic noise, transphobic and homophobic and misogynistic and racist messaging. It's like, you know, that stuff like it hits you with like it sticks, it leaves the mark, you know, but it's like it's everything else that, um, you know, like gives you the resilience to, um, uh, to, to carry on. And I will just say one more thing, and I hope you know, there's not really a lot of time to, um, to, to go into it. And maybe this is like Californianism, you know, um, but, um, you know, it's like, I am increasingly drawn to the therapeutic and the therapeutic as well as like collective uses of, uh, psychedelics, you know, just like psychedelics. Um, um, I have like a regular kind of like psychedelic assisted meditation practice that I do. And, um, you know, it is a, you experience at some level that different realities are possible, you know, and that, um, you know, like with, with any powerful substance, it's like, you know, use them wisely. But, uh, you know, I actually think there's some, um, some good teachings that can come from some chemicals and it can be part, not just of, you know, changing your head, but changing the world. With that, uh, we will part, but thank you so much, Susan, for this really important commentary about multiple intersections. And um, we're so grateful to you and hope to be in future conversation. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad to have been here. Thanks for asking me. Thank you.